in the back there? Um, uh, my question is, if uh, folks are visiting uh, town halls during this August recess, are there particular points from the report that you think uh, would make good questions for people to uh, bring up with their representatives and senators? I certainly think uh, in the cap and trade area, uh, since uh, my, my colleague here is too humble to speak up for, for his study, um, I'll do it for him. So we'll play into it, maybe you can respond after. If you look at cap and trade, how can you, you honestly say that you're going to end up reducing emissions without transferring some large cost to the American consumer? Because it goes without saying that the only way you can really do, reduce emissions is by having some cost associated with it. And therein is what everybody is trying to avoid. There was the lesson, right, from former Vice President Al Gore, who said the lesson from the BTU tax is when you make it a direct assault, energy, equals, energy use equals taxes, the American consumer and voter reacts. They've learned their lesson. It's now indirect. That's why it's complex and almost indecipherable. And so it would seem to me that a, a good question to add on to the, these questions over the health care debate is how much is the Waxman, uh, Markey, Boxer bill going to add to my annual tax bill? Yeah, I, I would even put that a different way. I would say, why are you doing this if it's not going to have a huge increase in prices? You want us to use less electricity? You want us to burn less coal? We're not going to use less if it's a postage stamp a day. What gives? Who's telling the truth here? If you really, if you really want to save the world, uh, don't you have to, number one, get every other country on board, and number two, make us pay a lot more? And are you really going to defend that? So I really put them on the defensive, sort of what is this supposed to accomplish, and you know, d defend it openly. Or number, th uh, pardon me, or number three, get serious about modern nuclear power. Probably. In Just to sort of add to the, to the health care thing, um, I would suggest anyone that's interested in this and is going to a town hall ought to go to page 39 of the report. Um, page 39 of the report, I pointed it out in my, in my talk. Uh, for one, it gives the, the VAT rate you need to fill in the hole for unfunded liabilities to Social Security and Medicare. But look at the column in the middle there, the unfunded liabilities and just billions of nominal dollars. Look at 2085, 2080, 2075, 2070. That's 22 trillion, 17 trillion, 13 trillion, 10 trillion. You've got probably over $100 trillion of unfunded liabilities expressed in nominal terms here. Certainly over $100 trillion in nominal terms. And if you look at what the Congressional Budget Office has said, they've said that this plan, H.R. 3200, that the House is considering is underfunded by hundreds of billions of dollars just in the second 10-year window. So the question I would have for your congressman is, um, you've already passed all of these other unfunded liabilities that I'm going to have to pay for, my kids are going to have to pay for them. What the heck are you doing putting another one on our shoulders? Yeah, and I'd phrase that even, I'd even throw a number, I'd say, you know, the most recent Medicare Trust Duke report says Medicare's $36.4 trillion in unfunded liability. Why don't we fix that before you create a new entitlement program? If I could toss out <clears throat> two suggestions, and they both come from work that uh, Sandra Fabry's done with the Center for Fiscal Accountability, it's the, the two types of transparency. The first is transparency on the way in. Uh, one of the things that is being asked uh, of congressmen and senators in some of these town hall meetings that so upsets them is, will you promise to read the bill before you vote for it? Mm -hmm. This is the problem that Sebelius and Specter had when it, when it, uh, it came up. And it's what uh, a number of the Democratic leaders have laughed and said, if you had to read the bills, we wouldn't pass anything. Um, I think that that reform, I guess uh, Congressman Boehner has a bill to require a three-day waiting period before the House could vote on a bill. It has to be on the web for everybody in America to read for three days. Um, I tend to think three days is not enough. I really think it needs to be five days. Uh, we need a full week uh, so that, because when they throw something up, I'm not necessarily going to you know, go to work and read it that day. What I'm more likely to do is somebody in the press, a blogger, other people would read the bill, send something out by email or even by snail mail uh, or in the newspaper the next day to say this is what's happening. And then I might then have a chance to go look at it. But I think if we had a requirement that any piece of legislation before it could be voted on in the House or the Senate, and if it gets amended, the five-day waiting period starts again. 
Okay, it's a cooling off period that some people used to want to do that for handguns. Well, some of these pieces of legislation are a lot more damaging than a handgun. Uh, and a, a five-day cooling off period so that people could actually read it. Um, and if you're going to have 1,000-page bills, you need that kind of time period. Now, my sense is that if you knew that anything you were putting into a piece of legislation was going to be online for five days, you wouldn't have stuff snuck in because everything would be found out. The stuff that went into the stimulus package to give the Goldman Sachs guys bonuses. And, and think that none of that goes into a bill if you know it's going to be there for five days. So transparency on the way in is one of the things that I think can come out of the unpleasantness of the last couple of years with people throwing 1,000-page um, bills up and overnight tarps. You know, we must give $750 million to my friends. There. Why? Trust me, it's an emergency. Nothing's an emergency. They can't wait five days for people to read the legislation. The other is transparency on the way out. Uh, and that's one where there's been some baby steps at the national level, but more than that at the state level. Texas, for instance, posts every contract the state enters into. Uh, every expenditure, every check is up on the web with a search engine so you can find out how much Joe and what company's got uh, in terms of uh, payments. Uh, and Utah and Florida have just this year passed it, so it's not up and running. But those two states have passed what I believe is the future of transparency. A requirement that all state contracts be posted, all state spending be posted, every check that they write, and the same requirement on all political subdivisions, schools, um, special taxing districts that nobody knew existed uh, that would go up online, cities, towns. I would like to see the city of Chicago's books online. Um, I would like to see Miami's uh, spending online. So. When you have transparency on the way in and transparency on the way out, I'm a lot more confident that what's in the bills will improve at both levels. Because if you know everyone's going to read it, you don't stick in crap. And if you know everybody's going to be able to follow the dollars, you don't hide the stuff to your friends because it's not going to get there. And people will see it happen. So transparency isn't the same thing as saying you can't do X, but if you're going to do X, the whole world will be watching and see exactly what you did. Now, if you're proud of that, good, let's do it. But if you're not proud of it, it probably never gets into the legislation in the first place. And then just adding on to that, in terms of the overall cost of government, uh, I'm sure a lot of you saw the list of the $100 million cuts that um, the Obama administration took several weeks to find. Um, just in terms of what was part of the, uh, those savings that they identified, those are the common sense things that uh, you just scratch your head and ask, why haven't we been doing this for years? For example, um, disconnecting pager connections that were not being used, or deciding we're, um, we're actually hosting a conference in our conference room, which we have available rather than going to a fancy hotel um, if we have a conference downtown. So those are the sorts of things. If and you can only imagine, I mean, if this is happening at the federal government, it's happening at every level of government, uh, and um, transparency will help um, shed a light on that and root it out um, preemptively, I would, I would argue. 